I've been talking to people who are working around the periphery of Broadway, a big choir, a jazz musician, a music teacher. But now I'd like to talk to someone who had the audacity to bring singing right back on Broadway, even if it was distanced and masked and out of doors. What he did was one of the most encouraging and hopeful acts of our times. I hope you'll enjoy my conversation with my friend, Michael McElroy. Describe what happened at the TKTS stairs. Everyone knows the famous stairs in yeah. Times Square. So um, about a month and a half ago, I got a call from Tom Kitt. And he's like, you know, I'm my friend has started this um, organization called NYC Next. And its mission is, you know, we have been lucky enough to make our living, to come to New York, to fulfill our dreams, to, to, to make our living living here in, uh, in the theater district. Um, and... We can't wait for tourists to come back to New York. We've made our living here. We love this city. It's up to New Yorkers, New York City folks, to start to build up the arts here for ourselves. We need to do it for ourselves. So it's all these different initiatives that support the arts and artists around the five boroughs. So they did a, um, a jazz trio in Brooklyn about four weeks ago, and they did something in Harlem this past weekend. They're doing something uh, in Midtown on the east side in a couple of weeks. And Tom came to me because they wanted to do something in the theater district with Broadway performers. Are these all outdoor things? So we know they're mm -hmm. safe. All outdoor, all yeah. outdoor. And, uh, and uh, so he said, what, the first idea was like, give my regards to Broadway. And I was like, mm -hmm. you know, that was just didn't speak to me. And he goes, well, what about that, that thing of, of, that you did with Billy a, a Sunday? And I said, well, that speaks to me. Let's do that. And so we began putting out asks and knowing that my choir, Broadway Inspirational Voices, would be a part of it. Um, yes, let's and, just back up one second. It's Broadway Inspirational Voices. Yeah, well, a lot of my work has been in the intersection of gospel music and musical theater um, and bringing those two genres together. And so that's because Broadway Inspirational Voices, all of the choir members are Broadway performers. So we started putting our, our minds together and, and heads together and started to create this. and. Um, did all this work and had Brian Perry come in to help us with it and this the fabulous team, Marianne and, um, and uh, um, Andy uh, from NYC Next and a whole team working, Zooming every day. And you know, I just love a Zoom call, but you know, yeah. Zooming and Zooming. And then we arrived and it was like, for some of us, it was the first time we'd been in that area of town, yeah. you know, since March, because there was no reason to go there. Right. Yeah. And so everyone just was bawling when they first got there because, you know, for us as Broadway performers, as people who make our living in, in the theater district, that's like half of your life is spent in that area. Yeah. Right. And yeah. so to walk back into it and it's pretty empty, it's not. You know what I mean? It had not been there since March. Was I a did a live stream last night on stage at the Florence Gould Theater on 60th and Madison. I've been on that stage so many times. I haven't performed. I haven't seen Ted Firth in person, mm -hmm. my piano player, mm -hmm. since March 9th. Yeah. And we rehearsed on uh, the computer. We only did one jam kazam. And then I saw him on stage on a live stream last night. Yeah. yeah. It was and so early. weird to like look at Ted and he was in a mask. And I'm like, what are you in a mask? Oh, of course you're in a mask. Right. Yeah. You so know, we and I was and face shields and the whole thing. And yeah, I saw that. This, you had face shields. I'll show some of that. Yeah. And then when we took the masks off and kept the face shields on to sing, people started bawling even more because it was the first time that people were singing with other people in a space. You know what I mean? Now we're all socially distanced. They marked everything out, so we followed all the COVID restrictions and everything. But it was, you know, we've been doing so many galas and virtual galas and and concerts all on this in this platform but it was the first time that you actually could hear hmm. people singing 
at the same time. And it was incredibly emotional. So it was cathartic. Did you rehearse? I mean, you rehearsed on Zoom. We rehearsed, no, we rehearsed that day. Okay. So we sent everybody tracks, they recorded. We had pre-records and everything so that everything could be heard um, and balanced. Um, and then everyone sang live at the same time. And um, so it, there were only, we only rehearsed that day at half hour before we did it. Crazy. And um, it was amazing. It was such an amazing feeling to, to do that arrangement, which, which brings together the old and the new right? With that group of diverse yes. artists, yeah. um, really with this idea of bringing back Broadway or starting to build the structures now for a more inclusive and diverse uh, um, industry now so that when we do go live, with the structures are in place. Oh, so it's going to be good. I can't yeah. actually, I'm so excited. Yeah. We've been given such a, a gift in this. In the midst of such darkness. Yeah, everything is where, where the, all the, the cards got all, you know, reshuffled yeah. and they're going to be in a different order. You know yeah. what I mean? When we play again. There's something about the integration of all of these things that happened at one time, right? COVID, which shut everything down, right? People getting sick and, you know, all of that. And My then husband had the virus. Me too. And George Floyd and oh, right. all these things happened oh. that everyone. Was you had the awful. virus? Yeah, I was sick in March. Um, I'm sorry. I didn't, yeah. I, pa Patrick was sick in March. So mm -hmm. I, 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 had a, I had a month with the sick husband. I didn't realize. Yeah. So it, wow. it's, it's, it I'm made sorry. us pay attention in a different way. And what it, I think it did was it showed the theater industry, which is so, we, we fancy ourselves so liberal and open-minded. But what it showed was we had actually replicated the same systems that we see in our country within our industry. And so we're looking at it and going, oh, wait a minute. Where is the diversity in the boardrooms? Where is the diversity on the creative teams? Where is the diversity in the stories that we're telling? Where's the diversity in our, our artists, in our theater institutions? And people going, wait a minute. <laughs> we, got, we have a responsibility as storytellers, as artists to lead society, not to fall prey to what society does, right? And so people are really open to and available to what does that change look like? Because ultimately that change serves us all. It serves us as individuals, it serves us as a community, it serves us as artists, storytellers, to bring more diversity because then it gives space for the potential of stories and things that we haven't even thought of, right? And so that's where we are right now. And that's not a bad place to be. And to me that says, okay, all the loss and the loss of life and employment, if we can get this right, then that will have been worth something. That will have been, we can honor the loss that we that that of life and of of and of you know jobs and employment, if we come back in a way that steps moves us forward. Mm -hmm. Everyone's going to benefit from learning to hear each other, you know, yeah. uh, and uh, and to pay attention, like you're saying, to those boardrooms and and. Who's getting to tell the stories? Where's the power? You know, where, you know, to, to, to redistribute and to share those spaces, instead of looking at it as losing something, look at what we, the potential of what we can gain. I love and that. So um, that's what I, you know, and I look at what we do as actors and I tell my students all the time, I look at us as being in service. You know, as an actor, when I bring that character to life that's on a flat piece of paper, it is my humanity, my empathy that brings that to life. So I am in service to that story, to that lived experience that I'm bringing to life. And so I want them to start to think of it in terms of what do you need to bring that honors that? It's not about you. It's about bringing that to life so that someone who's watching that can understand something in a different way. Um, and so, um, growing up in church and growing up in this idea of service and giving back and mentorship and all of that, that just it seems more important than ever now that we really invest in the future and start creating the future we want now. So that my friend of mine said, think of seven generations from now. What do you want it to look like? And then what do we have to start doing now to make that happen? Right. Right. So of all these things you're doing, one of the things I asked everybody that I've spoken to is, uh, you know, there is a, there was a chef who was asked, like, what's what's one thing in your life like uh, that's that's uh, like an impossible dream? Like and the, the, the chef, you know, said, uh, 
would be to make hot ice cream, like something that's just mm. impossible, that seems impossible, but the pandemic is making hot ice cream possible. Things mm -hmm. that you you really, you you imagined, uh, uh, but that seemed impossible, but they're mm -hmm. now possible. Mm -hmm. This is that for you is Black Theater United, which mm -hmm. is New York City next. It's mm -hmm. these open up, opening up these conversations, isn't it? Right, yeah, and it's, you know, even with my work and my teaching, because we're in this platform, uh, whether it's Zoom or streaming or whatever we're in, I um, it allows me to branch out, you know? And so like I'm working on a project that I'm writing for my students, but I've also brought in students from other programs, which you could never do. Right. Right. So it's allowed us to dream in a different way. It's like uh, my live stream last night. I probably reached people all over the world in one exactly. night. Exactly. I never would have been able to sing for someone in Greece, you yeah. know, in France, you know, in the at same, same time, night. Let alone at the same time. <laughs> let alone at the same time, yeah. And now they can stream it, you know, tonight or something. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's, it's like my mind is like, whoa, you know. But um, how are your students responding to this? Um, um, how do you feel about young people? I have three. I have uh, three teenagers now. Wow. They're okay. You know, I start my classes now. I'm much more conscious of start, starting by saying, okay, how are we today? What's going on? And I ask them to tell me something good that happened this week. Um, and also reminding them that this space that we have, we this is our, our, our safe haven, right? So if there's something that's happening in the world that you can bring in that will serve your work, by all means, bring it in. But if it doesn't serve your work, let it be on the other side right now and let's find our joy and let this be a refuge for who we are as human beings in this moment um, so that we can live in this moment presently and see where it takes us. Um, and sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes I have to kind of charge them a little bit more. Sometimes, I, But if I can get them centered in the work and the doing of it, they always leave transformed. They always leave in a different place than they came in. Is there a new approach that you have to take per student because you can't see them all at once? You have to sort of go one at a time. Well, what I do now is I start all my classes because I teach vocal performance, which is the, you know acting for song. And whereas I used to in the classroom, I could say, okay, today these five people are working and then coach them each individually. Now I go, okay, I'll do three people, but the first 20 minutes, I'll give everybody the same exercise. And then they'll engage it and then I'll put a Google Doc in the chat room and then I'll go, okay, when they finish it, then they all put their discoveries and things so that everybody works every class. Which is like going, like breaking down the text, things like that, like a project. Mm -hmm. Yes, I give them an exercise to do with, this, with their individual assigned song. And then what discoveries they made, what they learned about it, and then I'll coach the three individuals. But that way they're not sitting in a Zoom square like this for an hour and 15 minutes. Like, uh, you know, so that everybody works, it gets them more active, it keeps them engaged. Yeah, yeah, I've had a lot of teachers on. That was how this all kind of started. Uh, I, I just wanted to know how people were going to go on uh, mm -hmm. using their voices and singing. And yours is the most outstanding, almost metaphorical voice as well as physical mm -hmm. voice. Uh, other than New York City Next, are there new performances that you're finding yourself putting together either for your students or with professionals? I mean, are you in rehearsal all the time, even if you're not leaving that apartment at the moment? Um, well, like I said, uh, November 2nd, November 2nd. rehearsal for a piece that I'm writing that one of my co-faculty members is directing. Um, and uh, we have five other musical theater programs around the country who have two to four students who are also taking part in it. Can you say yeah. the name or, or not yet? What I've done is I've taken um, Shakespeare sonnets and I've integrated them with black music genres. So gospel, soul, pop, R&B, folk. Um, and it follows this journey of this one kid through a, a sort of awakening. Um, and so it, it's, at times you have the sonnet and then you have a contemporary lyric response. At times you have the sonnet and it's actually set to music in a, in a black genre, or sometimes you have the sonnet being interrogated uh, in today's, you know, mentality. And so- um, The sonnets were one person's path? Yeah. Were they? Yeah. Yeah. All, yeah. And so it's, it's, 
we start rehearsals uh, November 2nd. We'll see how it goes. So, is there a GoFundMe page <laughs> or a uh, website? It's for NYU. Yet? It's from NYU. But I know, like, NYU. We, we have, just like you said, we've made a big shift in this time. So, for example, we have two outreach programs that happen every year. One, we partner with Covenant House, uh, New York, and one with Ronald McDonald House, New York. So Broadway inspirational voices and Covenant House often do these performances. We at, have uh, we have our a, a program with them. So right, we do right, right. a songwriter teaching artists who work with them to cultivate their artistic voice. And so they create music together and then we do music videos of it. The same with our kids at Ronald McDonald House. I bring in a Broadway composer. They meet over Zoom with um, the child and then the composer goes away, writes a song based on what they learned. And then my choir members come together and then we create a music video that then gets um, sent to the house as like a VH1 or an MTV kind of video release that the family gets to watch. And then we release it on our social media channels and that we never could do before. But like you said, now right. our outreach programs are into, go out to the world now. People get to see what we've been doing for the last nine and 10 years. So uh, that shift we made, so everything we do is virtual, all the video, all the audio, all, all that stuff, we had to make that shift to keep active and keep Do doing you find everything. that bringing this music to Covenant House just helps to draw both spirit together as well as awareness of what the good the Covenant House does? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. Now, and the thing about I, house. Oh, yeah. I run a mother's uh, community that has 4,000 parents in it, 4,000 mm. moms, and they have for 15 years been a 501c3 and I've been talking to Audra about making, I mean, it's not a very wealthy organization, but it has had sponsors and it has had donations from within the group because it's a free service downtown mm -hmm. and their plans to give a chunk of money to Covenant House. But I would love to talk to someone about, yeah, I'll connect about Covenant House. Yeah. But I, what I love about what, what you're saying in terms of being a, an organization that's all mothers, and working with Covenant House, what I find so beautiful about that is these are young kid youth that have, you know, are homeless. Um, some have, have been trafficked um, and have been rejected by the people who should love them most, right? So there's something that is quite powerful to me and emotional and beautiful about mothers stepping in and saying, we want to give to this to in some way know that our, our support allows you to have some connection to mothers, right? That you have been, that has not been given to you, right? Yeah. And I think there's something really powerful about that, that it's coming from mothers. The, the, the parent wanted a part of the parent uh, partnership that should be there for you always, that should be with you through thick and thin and, you know, give you some tough love, but should be there and have your back. The women who are now me, you know, who are in their late forties and so on, who are just like, I got this, you know, like I, we're ready to, we're strong. We are, we're strong mothers. We're a good community to, to look now for because our you know for help everybody is wanting to do something in this world there seems to be so much of things that are telling us that different is bad and we're so fractured and it's either either you are totally in line with everything i think feel and believe or you're the enemy it's like so any opportunities for those some of us who are hungry for authentic connection and that's something that is going to put something good into the world because there seems to be such negativity that I want to be a part of whatever that thing is that brings good into the world, whether it's through my art, through it's through my teaching, or just trying to be a good person, right? Um, 
and failing miserably at all of them at any given moment, right? No. You know, we do, we do. And we have to offer grace and forgiveness to ourselves and ask for forgiveness when we mess up and hope that people will give us forgiveness and that we can be forgiven and forgiving, you know, but it's in this moment, it's essential. Yeah, we have to learn that living is like, is, is joy and living is to feel pain, that we don't have to always sort of hide that or smother it or or suppress it, that that is living. Living is to live boldly in both colors, you know, the darkness and the light. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I agree. I, I totally agree. There's a lot of love to tap into, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. In, in different corners of the world. Mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. And I'm, I just wanted you to know that you were being heard. Um, mm -hmm. I just, that's what I wanted to say to you is that I hear you and that you are a love letter to New uh, York City <laughs> and to our industry. You're a walking love letter. Mm. And uh, so I'm very proud um, of everything you're doing. And thank uh, you. And you so, too. This is wonderful. Well, <laughs> thank you for letting me just think it out loud and let other people think about, you know, ways to pay attention to show business and people like you and will follow you on Instagram. Oh, and yeah. follow Black Theater United and Broadway Inspirational Voices and New York City Next yes. and um, the Covenant House and uh, yeah. the work you're doing there with uh, combining the mu the music yeah. um, and NYU and the changes. It's called Muse. Muse is the new group that I'm in, the new organization that actually goes live next week, oh. which is called Muse, which is Musicians United for Social Equity. And it's all like composers, orchestrators, musical directors, conductors um, coming together to begin to look at the music field in, in our theater industry and the lack of diversity and start to go, how can we create pipelines to musicians to know that there is a there is an opportunity to become a part of the musical theater yes. industry through and make sure that those pathways are there. Because a lot of us, I mean, I came through going to school, but a lot of composers- It was and, Carnegie Mellon? Yeah, Carnegie Mellon, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. And, uh, we, were teen, we were almost college students when we met. So uh, <laughs> I always right. remember where somebody came from, yeah. Right. You know, in certain fields within the theater industry, in a lot of them, it's who you know. So if you're now a, a conductor or a musical director, odds are someone knew you and you assisted someone and made your way up that way. And what they were looking at is, if you don't have access, how do you get into that room? Right. If you don't know the people in the room. So what we want to do is provide access by creating pipelines to musicians all over the country to say, if this is something you're interested in, here's some classes, some master classes. Here are some um, internship possibilities that we're going to create so that you if this is something that you think you could do and you have the skills and will cultivate those skills and have the talent and the aptitude for and the passion for. We want to be able to offer more diversity and more diverse voices to have that pathway. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think that we are uh, our own gatekeepers in a way? Like yeah. we can we can create the gateways. Yes. Michael, and, and I never further. thought that. I never no. thought that. I came from a different generation. Mm -hmm. I, I stood at the door a lot and was trying to be ladylike and, mm -hmm. um, you know, audition. And, and I didn't think to write my own way to to op to be my own gatekeeper, mm -hmm. to have my peers and me create stuff and right. do it. Right. I don't know if you even re you remember how it felt, you know, and that it was sort of, it's like the late eighties, you know, when we were kids and teenagers yeah. coming up and we didn't feel like right, writing our way and make and being each other's gatekeepers. And right. now we're the adults and we yeah. have to change those rules and, and open gates mm -hmm. for each other. Right. Yeah. It's not having agency. You know what I mean? So much of the, old kind of when we first came into I sound different. like such an old lady like some no, mom, like shift. a different generation but, but I have to be totally honest shifted. you know pardon it, it's totally shifted you know what I mean when we came up everything was through a certain kind of framework in terms of how you got in the room who saw you all that stuff was it was just different now you know young artists have more agency with all these social media platforms you can create your own show you can put it on yes. youtube you can, so they have a different kind of agency mm -hmm. um, uh, that they bring into the room i just want them to have a sense of history and understanding and and empathy and humanity to balance that agency ah. and not and that it doesn't <laughs> lean into entitlement but you know we understood the generation that came before us you know what i mean and that honored that Ooh, yeah. they have a difference in just what they know about history and it's not valued 
You know what I mean? It's considered, oh, that's the old thing. But oh, I want yeah. the, the old thing is why we have what's happening now. So understanding that will give you the combination of that, what is the history and who you are now put together will lead us into the next space. I got but, history, uh, Michael. I know Pep, my Pippin and stuff. Right. You know, I mean, that's, but but yeah. that gives you an understanding of where oh. you can go. Where well, the Sunday, goes. there you were. Yeah. You were taking all the points of light and bringing yeah. them together in balance and harmony. Yeah. And, you know, the island of the Grand Jatte, you mm -hmm. know, there you are on, is, is this island in the middle of the Seine in Paris. And, um, and, so similarly is Times Square and watching mm -hmm. you be the George Surratt for me uh, of that. You uh, were Mandy Patinkin uh, to me that day. And that's why I was like, I have to speak. You were the blank canvas uh, and you put your dots and you had all uh, your friends and the the kind of uh, the, uh, the, the, the fragments, you know, this voice, that voice, we were all, they were all uh, in different places, but they all came together. And, and that song is all about people yeah. of different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. You have all different uh, yeah. socioeconomic <laughs> groups mm -hmm. in, in the island of the Grand Jatte, and they come together as a cosmopolitan island of harmony where people act as one. Uh, and it is one of the great unifying symbols in the history of musical theater. Mm -hmm. which you kind of hijacked, you know, mm -hmm. for an absolutely perfect love letter mm -hmm. to the to the future. Yeah. Yeah. I, you know, we, we chose the song thinking of it in one way. And then as I started to really think about it more, I was like, oh, my gosh. And I said that here we have this artist who transformed the field, you know, by taking it piece by piece and, and risking and daring and trying something new that he didn't know if it would work, but he was open to it. And then when you could he, literally be describing Sondheim or Surratt. Right. Which and one? You put it together and it transformed the art world, right? And he didn't know that. Yeah, and he right. never saw it. He never got, and the real George Surratt never got to see any of his paintings sold in his lifetime. And this one painting in the Chicago Museum is now like, transformed, the father of pointillism, transformed everything. And that's what this moment gives us. It gives us the opportunity to painstakingly, to, to be very mindful and, and, and passionate about and committed to bit by bit, putting together the world we want to see when we come back together. Because live theater will come back. It is, an, it is a, it's like air, oxygen, to the society. We need those moments to come into that little space and be in community and tell stories and people live in the fantasy of that, that only live theater can do. A movie doesn't do that, right? It's an exchange of energy, right? Mm -hmm. And since the beginning of time, human beings have needed that like air and it's going to come back because it has to, right? Mm -hmm. But when we come back, if we do the work now, we can come back in a whole new and exciting way that takes us into the next, you know, whatever period of time, right? Yeah. yeah. Well, as a mother to kids and so on, I'm right, I'm behind, I'm behind these ideas. Mm -hmm. And I have three girls, like the little women, like the book, you uh -huh. know, they're coming into it and I want them, I want them to hear yeah. and follow you and follow these ideas and this light. Yeah. Uh -huh. But uh, that song was great. And what it stands for is just your history. You know, mm. you've always been a teacher and a creator and a dazzling actor. So I just wish you the very best. I will Thank put you. this together uh, lovingly and admiringly. And I'll put all sorts of links and mm -hmm. uh, maybe... Um, you know, in a couple of months, you come back and let me know how everything is going. I will. You know, in yeah. progress. Anytime yeah. you want, I'm here. All right, Michael, money yeah. blessings. Congratulations on everything doing. Thank you. Be safe. Bye bye. You too. I hope you enjoyed my conversation. Um, that moment uh, in Times Square that made me call him, it really wasn't nostalgic. You know, Michael McElroy, he didn't give his regards to Broadway, but he was forward looking and is forward looking. It's all about the next Broadway and the one yet to arrive, but that is on its way. Muse is committed to creating diversity within the music departments of the theater industry by providing access, internships, mentorships, and support to historically marginalized people of color. We recognize the lack of opportunities, particularly for black and brown artists looking to pursue careers in this field. 
Our mission is to cultivate more racial equity in high-level positions, such as music direction, arranging, orchestrating, and various other jobs related to the success of theatrical productions. By developing pipelines and partnering with like-minded organizations, Muse will challenge systemic acts of exclusion and support musicians as we transition to a more diverse and inclusive environment for all. Musicians United for Social Equity.